So this is part two of a series of three. If you have not watched part one yet, you may want to do that because this can get really confusing if you haven't got the basics. And I'm going to refer back to the previous video multiple times just to keep this video nice and short. Ow! I'm studying! I promise! So everybody knows a line is just a straight bar and that's it. But in games, you have to actually do more than that. You have a start point and an end point and then a segment in between. That's what this image here is. So you have a set length that you know between those two points. Effectively, it's a vector and has an end point and a start point. Very simple. But with a plane, that image, you see that there's three points in space somewhere. And then you have those three particular pieces makes a triangular surface. And then you have a plane. The reason you have three points instead of four is because it's any three points in space automatically makes a triangle. It add a fourth dot in there somewhere, and it may not be on that flat surface, now you have a problem. So that's why games always use triangles instead of squares. So obviously with a line, you're gonna have a tangent to it, which actually is just the 90 degree vector to the actual main vector between the two endpoints. But that's really useful for us because we're gonna need that in order to determine which side of the line is being impacted and also what kind of force we're going to apply to the actual objects that are impacting that line. For a plane, you can also figure that out by using the cross product between the three points. There's actually quite a bit of information we need to store about this line, beyond just the endpoints and how long it is. So we're gonna start off by finding the center point of the actual line by taking the two endpoints, add them together and divide by two, that gives the center point. And then we have a radius, which is gonna be half the length plus a little bit of a buffer. Uh, that's gonna define a circle around the whole line to determine if something is close enough to bother even doing collision math in the first place. After that, we're gonna actually take the two points that we have and store the overall length. And then we're gonna have a tangent for it. And we're gonna take that tangent and normalize it down to a single unit. We're going to take the vector between the two points and normalize that as well. And then overall, we're going to have those particular pieces, the length, we're going to have the mass of the object as well. As an alternate to having one large circle around the line, you can do this instead. By having multiple circles around a really long line, you kind of reduce the amount of area that you're checking to see if there is a collision. So it kind of reduces a lot of the math that you're going to have to work with with lines and colliders. So it's a little bit more efficient. But if you have too many circles, then now you're checking a lot of different circles and it becomes a problem. So kind of a work around that is to have one large circle around the object. If things are close enough, then you check the actual smaller circles. Then if something's colliding, you can actually do the actual line math and you get a little bit of a performance boost because you're not checking against every single possibility inside that large circle. So starting with lines and circles, we're going to determine if a circle is colliding with a line, which is pretty much going to be used extensively throughout this whole series and also for games in general. So in this situation we have here, we have a circle inside of the detection range of a line, and then we're going to determine if, if it is colliding with the line and where and along the line it actually is colliding. So the first step is to determine where the start point of the line is, which we have already marked in the overall storage capacity. So we're gonna have that start point to the center point of the circle, and we're gonna draw a vector from those uh, particular points. Then we're gonna take that vector and we're gonna dot product with the actual segment itself, so that normalized vector, to determine where along that particular line is actually the center point of the circle, kind of relative along the tangent. So this image here. Once we've done that, we can determine where along the line, if at all, is actually going to be in there. So remember that a vector is an infinite length of one direction or the other, and we have to determine where along that infinite length is actually going to be a collider. If you don't take in consideration the actual distance from the start point along that line, you're going to end up with something way, way down out into space, and it's going to collide with the vector along that. So we kind of have to limit it there. So something to consider when you're actually looking at the overall length along this actual line, we have to consider the situation like this, where the circle's beyond the length of the line at the center point, but part of the radius is actually overlapping the actual line as what's colliding with it. 
So something to consider is to make sure that you're actually working between the minimum and maximum area if that's possible. So we have the actual line length minus the actual radii. So the start point backwards, having the radius subtracted from the length, all the way between that and the overall length plus the radius of the circle. If it's along that line, it has the potential of being along the line segment as a whole. So now that we know that the center point of the circle is along the line within range, we have to determine if the, the ball itself is actually close enough to the line to trigger the actual collision with it. So you might have a situation where your line is here, but your ball is way out here, but within the overall radius that we would work with. So we have to determine, is it close enough? Is it here or is it here? to determine should we do a collision in the first place. To do that, we take that vector we created from the start point to the center of the circle, and we dot product it with the tangent of the circle. So we kind of get a range that we have between the actual line itself and the actual center point itself. So now we have the distance along the tangent that the center point of the circle is from the line. If it's a positive number, we know it's on one side of the line that we actually want. If it's a negative number, it's on the opposite side of the line. The reason why that matters is this particular situation here. So we have an object that's passed into the object and has gone through. Now the force is gonna apply it, make it go the opposite direction, and then it gets bounced to the other side of the line. Now it's gonna bounce off the object again, go the wrong direction, and back and forth, back and forth endlessly. So the object gets trapped in the center on the line. That becomes a major issue. The way around that is to have one-sided lines only. If you need a second object that has another line on the other side, so you have a solid object, then you put another line with the tangent on the out, facing outward from the object, and that way it goes in and doesn't get stuck, or it can go if it has to go through, we can got teleported through the object. A major issue, very common. So if the circle center point is between the endpoints of the line, then we know that is actually colliding with the line itself. So we can use the tangent of the line as the collider vector. And it's like, just like we had that vector between the two center points of the circles, this is actually the, the collider line that we're gonna use in order to determine the velocities towards each other. So just like we did with the circle, we use the tangent and then dot product the vectors uh, based off of that. And we can determine the, the velocities, work through the math exactly the same way. So something to note at this point, is if the center point is beyond the length of the line or before it because of the negative value, then we know that the actual radius of the circle is not colliding with the line itself, it's colliding with an endpoint. But we've defined a rectangle around that line. We're not actually looking at the actual confirmed collision, we're looking at a potential of one. So because we have a round object looking at a point, we need actually need to do a comparison of the length between the end point that's closest to, to the center point of the circle. We added a little bit of a buffer because we don't want to divide by later, uh, zero later. So we're going to make sure that we add a little buffer to the radius length. And then if that length of the vector between the two points is close enough, then we go back to our circle and circle collisions. We don't even have to worry about the line portion of this particular video at all. So if it's within the two, two points, then we actually have to continue on with this whole process and collide with the line itself. So now that we've calculated the force we need to apply to each object, we need to run it through this particular math that we've had before in the circle versus circle collider video that we made last time. And remember we apply the mass and the bounce factors to that and then apply it to the actual objects. So with the line, you need to make sure that you move all the points, not just the center point depending on how you made the program. Overlap correction can be a little tricky. It all comes down to the order that you do things in. So always do the endpoints first if you think it might be colliding with that. If it's like beyond the actual segment of the line for the center point of the external circle. The reason why we do that is if you have a situation like this where it overlaps the circle, well, now you have an issue because it's going to have overlap with the circle and the line. If you do both, overlap is going to be all wrong. So what we do is we make a little circle at the end of the endpoint. So I have a small radius like a 0 0.1 or a 0 0.001, depending on the scale of your world. Then you do the overall circle uh, collider that we had in the previous video, which calculates the overlap correction. You apply that to the circle externally, 
and then you apply it to the whole line and its completeness to the actual line itself to overlap correct that. So in theory, the endpoint should always hit the line first, no matter what. So if, even if you have a perfectly parallel lines and they come along and touch each other, the endpoint is still going to touch the line, so it should never be an issue. But sometimes situations like that arise where you have a line overlapping another one and the endpoint never has a chance to touch. So to check for this type of issue, we have a whole bunch of code and mathematics to run through. I'll do it really quick. It's more of important for rotation physics, and I'll get to that portion later in another video. So this is the function I put together in order to determine if two lines are intersecting. It's mostly based off of this particular link here, and I'll put that in the comments below. It starts off by taking endpoints of each of our line segments and recording those. It's using a vector because in this particular program, Vectors allow floating points and points use integers. So I needed floats, hence the vectors. And I do that for both lines, one and two. This math is explained in this particular link up here. So I'm not gonna cover it that much, but this goal is to determine if the slopes themselves are actually moving toward each other in any way. That's this delta value. If it's zero, that means they're completely parallel and unless they are exactly the same line, which, which is extremely unlikely, then we know that they're uh, parallel if it's zero. So if they are not parallel, we have to determine where that particular intersection point for those infinitely long lines are. It's infinitely long because this does not care if is it a line segment or an infinitely long line? So they're in infinitely long lines will intersect at some point, no matter where it's at. So we have to determine what that point is. The last step is actually making sure that it's actually within the line segment that we have been given. So if we take these particular endpoints and we can make a rectangle based off of these being in the corners, which is what is being done here by determining what's the min and max values for each location. And then is the point that we've been having inside the intersection, is it between those two values? If it is, then it's true. We do the same thing for X and Y. So if it's true for both of these, it's within the box that we've been defined. And it's, therefore it has to be on the line that we have because the dot's always on the line. But, we have to make sure we do that for both lines. So if it is on the line inside of the box for line one, we have to check to see if it's inside the line inside the box for line two. And that's what this is doing. The reason we do that is there's situations where we might have two lines that are close to each other. Maybe one endpoint is right at the end or next to another line, but they don't actually cross. So that's kind of why we have to check both lines. If both of them are still true for both of these lines, then we can pass back they actually do intersect. If we need that point, for like a later video where we have the intersection will make difference for uh, rotation physics, we have that available to us right here. With all that mathematics covered, we can actually cheat to get around it most of the time. So what we can do is do this instead where you add thickness to the line and make it so that it's more potential for a collision because you don't have an infinitely thin line to actually have to worry about a collider. The whole radius circle issue that we had from before. So if we add a little bit of radius to it, we can actually have a situation where it's easy to determine if a circle has collided with a line because we just double the width of the actual circle we're working with or some other constant value. It's close enough to the line to make it look like to the user that it bounced off the line. It's just cheating. It works out real nice. So there are obviously some more known problems to this particular situation beyond what was in the circles and circle video. So sometimes you have this situation where you have an object that's teleported into another object and it actually ends up colliding with an external object on the other side of it, it should never have touched in the first place. So now you have two collisions where there should have only been one. It's kind of a tough situation. Uh, you kind of have to determine if there is one or another or just live with the situation. 
Sometimes if you add that little cheat mechanism for the thickness of the line, then make it a little bit longer uh, of a distance and it kind of avoids most of these situations. Also, if you have one-sided objects and just kind of build your actual uh, environment to kind of avoid this type of thing, it's not as a prominent and the users will probably notice it. If they see it one time, it probably won't happen again. The other issues we might run into is kind of like in the circle ones where you had uh, multiple objects hitting the same thing, overlap correct. So you have that issue with this as well with lines. Without rotation physics, it's not too bad, but it becomes more of an issue with rotation physics. So one last major problem is if you have an object get stuck between two lines, that maybe the circle of that, that you're working with actually is smaller than the gap that you have between the two objects. So it just bounces in between those two items overall. So that's kind of a world design issue where you just don't place objects too close together that the ball might get stuck inside of it and just kind of bounce back and forth forever. Kind of the same situation where we had where we had two-sided lines and things would get stuck inside of it. Now if you have two one-sided lines, just make sure they're facing out from each other so they can just pass through an object and the user will kind of laugh at it. Maybe make fun of your program a little bit, but at least it won't break. That was part two of the Collider series. So we have pretty much everything we need to do for planes and spheres, lines and circles in order to work through all the colliders that we need. So it's just gonna be combining those things together. So part three, we'll look at how to combine those together, kind of like what we did with the circle endpoints with the line. And we're gonna make complex objects. We're gonna process through all that, really looking into the code of how to program this. So if you have any comments or questions, let me know below. Like and subscribe as usual. Ow! I'm studying! I promise! Longer than half the radius of the actual line. Half the radius. Actually do a collision math in the first place. And there goes a bell. Turn it to having that one large circle. You can actually do this instead. Collisions. We apply forces to each object just like before. Overlap correction is a little tricky because you can have this type of situation where just like we did with the circle versus uh, circle colliders that colliders, colliders.